Welcome to Alpha Wolf Capital. I'm Tim and I want to personally thank you for stopping by. This channel is designed to help small companies, both public and private, gain exposure with potential consumers, investors, even partners. Take, for example, today's guest, Kirsten Brewer from Hydrograph. Hydrograph is one of the world's purest producers of graphene, often called the wonder material. Currently positioned to be a global leader in commercializing graphene at scale. Hydrograph's patented technology uniquely positions the company for multiple high growth markets in the production of graphene and other strategic materials. Hydrograph Hyperion detonation technology enables them to create graphene at scale with 99.8% Purity. The characteristics of graphene are 200 times stronger than steel, hard, harder than diamonds, more conductive than copper. But I'm going to let Kirsten tell you more about graphene in just a moment. This is not to be taken as investment advice. I am not a certified financial planner. This is for education and entertainment purposes only. I encourage everyone to do their own due diligence. Hey everybody, Tim from Alpha Wolf Capital coming at you with a follow-up to a fantastic story that uh, I couldn't wait to do this one because there's some some exciting things going on. Uh, Kirsten Brewer, is it just Brewer, right? That's correct. Kirsten Brewer, who is the CEO of <laughs> Hydrograph, hasn't been officially, it's interim at, at the moment, but it needs to get done. It needs to be the CEO of Hydrograph uh, doing a follow-up. Very, very interesting company, incredible product. Uh, ticker symbol is H-G-R-A-F. And Kirsten, thank you so much for coming back in and giving us an update. Thanks for having me on. So I, 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 the most recent thing that I saw that I think is is a big deal is is you've extended the relationship with Manchester, right? Mm -hmm. And now, if you can, just give everybody a little little background on who Manchester is and and what Hydrograph does. Okay, just just for those people that may not know. Sure. So as a reminder on Hydrograph, we are a company that produces graphene via detonation synthesis. So we are purely synthetic. We pump in hydrocarbon gases. So really carbon is contained in the gases that we use. These are invisible gases. We ignite that with a spark from an electrode and that rips apart the molecules and that converts it into a black powder. Other companies normally start with graphite as a feedstock, but there's also plasma that uses methane. So graphene was discovered in Manchester in 2004, um, associated with the University of Manchester. And there was um, an innovation center that started, which is called the GEEK, called the Graphene Engineering Innovation Center, of which we are a part of. So we have a laboratory there with our own research scientists, but the GEEK team also has their own staff. And basically this um, hotspot has become the primary point for customers to go when they want to start integrating graphene into their product. So a huge amount of expertise. They have all of the industrial prototyping machines, all of the characterization devices. And because of that, it's been a really fantastic vehicle for us to expedite commercialization. We've been involved in a number of very large projects since we joined. Um, I think it's a little bit lucky for us that our production process produces such a high purity consistent graphene. So we've been selected, um, to my knowledge, for most of their uh, large scale products or projects. And so some of those, um, you know, it's really not only grown word of mouth, but some of these projects that I insinuated are kind of mentioned earlier. Um, one of them we're hoping to get word of quite soon, and that would be for a product order. Um, and that would be for the scale up, and we would be announcing that with PR. Okay. <laughs> so let me ask you a question with graphene, and it's been called a material that is, I mean, it's, it's stronger than steel, right? Um, I mean, 
can you just give a quick what are all the benefits that graphene it's more conductive i mean there's there's all kinds of incredible benefits to graphene right Yes, so it is the strongest and most conductive material ever discovered, but I think the biggest benefit, apart from those um, obvious superlative qualities that graphene has, is you can really add on functionality. So with legacy materials, you're really, if you're going to exploit one characteristic, you're often going to have a decrease in another area. So if you're adding to strength, it's perhaps becoming more brittle. With graphene, we can really layer on these um, functionalities, and you can really make um, completely different products with that. So I think the future is very bright with graphene. And I would say with 2D materials in general, I would say that we've really only scratched the surface scientifically on what's possible. Okay. So I, I'm hearing concrete is, is a big opportunity for graphene. Is that correct? And what would the benefits be for that? Mostly for just mechanical strength. So you do have some anti-corrosive properties, um, some water resistive properties, but usually because carbon or concrete is a very carbon intensive material, you're going to decrease the amount of concrete used and therefore that lowers the carbon emissions. So and you are effectively uh, an EPA, you're, you're, you're an environmental play. You're, you're good for the environment. We are. I would say hydrograph is good for the environment in two ways. For one, our production process has the lowest energy use in the industry. And secondly, using graphene in various materials has a very strong sustainability aspect. Not only for you can use less material, but there's proof that adding graphene, for example, to polymers can improve the efficiency of machines because they can run faster as it has a lubricating effect. Um, and there's lots more. It can help in recycling polymers as well. And I think that as we start to have more use cases with graphene, there will be a host of kind of tangential benefits. And those are all the things that you're exploring at the Geek, right? Yes. <laughs> so that relationship that you just extended is, is pretty important. Very important. Right. Um, we're very, very happy at the Geek. It's a cost-effective um, vehicle, I think, for the company. And it has really put us in touch with customers that we probably wouldn't have had access to at this stage. And um, kind of funny enough, we've been connected with a lot of U.S. departments through the U.K. And being more U.S. based, at least operationally, it's been interesting that we've had those connections through the geek instead of in our home country. That's that's fantastic. So let, let's talk about you and I were talking about before we opt on that um, there is a lot of it's graphene is definitely a lot of interest is picking up. A lot of different players are coming to, to market and making claims of their purity, right? Um, and I just, I wanted to get your take on that. I mean, what, what are your views on all these different claims that are out there? Yes, I want to be cautious what I say because I don't want to speak poorly of our competitors. But I do think that um, this is not solved. I think that what I said previously is, you know, companies their graphene doesn't always match their data sheets. And then further, we hear from multiple customers that when they order a small amount, it could work okay. And then they order a larger amount. It's not the same at all. It doesn't match the previous batch and it doesn't match the data sheet. So I think that these issues that have plagued us are not really rectified. And I would say it's on both sides. It's from graphite derived graphene and also from synthetic graphenes. And if you think of the feedstocks, it makes sense because they're naturally occurring impurities in graphite and in methane. In most of the dominant feedstocks, it's going to, you know, consistently be an issue. It just takes so much energy, not only to get it down to very few layer, but to make sure that it's done in a consistent and methodical manner. And we are very lucky with our production process because it's really the explosion. And we think the heat that's generated in that, which gives us the perfect crystallinity that we have, that gives us that extreme mechanical and conductivity performance improvement. And, and you're able to reproduce that same result every time. We have scaled up this unit um, close to 10 times. Every single time we've scaled it up, every single time we turn it on, it is exactly the same graphene. <laughs> so it's really beautiful, you know, how this has occurred for us. Really, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, but that makes so much sense to me because if you were using biomass or if you're using some other some other 
how do you get consistent every single time, right? I mean, it, it's got to be, I would think, very challenging. Whereas you're, you have the same same input every time, right? Mm -hmm. It's the same. It, so you you would you would assume that that same input is going to create the same result over and over, right? Exactly. I think it's equal parts the feedstock and the environment that we create in the unit. And because we have so much control of the environment, we know exactly what we're going to get. And we have all different variations on tweaking that. And we can produce different graphenes, for example. What is your, if you don't mind me asking, your, what do you, what most excites you about Hydrograph and what you're, what you're doing? Most exciting. That's a hard question because I love so much of it. But I think that really from a very general sense, what we do can make everything better. We can make better products. We can quite literally improve the standard of living for many people, especially if we're considering the environmental benefits. But I think it's really exciting to work for a company that's so new in a new industry. And for us, especially, we have a completely unique production process. And I mean, decades from now, I hope that we're going to be able to look out into the world and see what we've done everywhere, you know, in building materials and technology. I just think that that feeling that we have created something is extremely exciting. So I, I'm, a, I'm a, you know, as I get older, uh, when I look back at my history of, of investing, I, the first when I first started, all I cared about was making money. That was really all it was. <laughs> this is another way to make money. And then I wanted to help retail investors become better investors because they're the butt of every Wall Street joke. But I realized that retail investors just really want to be told when to buy and when to sell. They don't want to learn the process of, of what you need to do to find good companies. Mm -hmm. And then I had this epiphany that, you know, I, I would like to have a positive impact on as many lives as I possibly can. And I do know for a fact that I came into this world with nothing. 99% sure I'm leaving with nothing. So what matters is what you do in the span that you're here, right? Mm -hmm. And then I started thinking about the, the biggest way to have the biggest impact in a positive way is on as many lives as possible is finding these small companies that are doing big, amazing things. And you're one of them. There are a bunch of them out there that people don't know about because they're too small. CNBC is not going to pick them up. Bloomberg's not going to pick them up because they're just too damn small. When you're running a $10 billion fund, and you allocate a portion of your fund towards your stock allocation, how are you going to allocate 3% of a $10 billion fund towards a small cap company? It's going to be, it's impossible. It can't be done. So if you just look at helping a small company become a billion dollar corporation, how many lives are positively impacted just from that? Just from the company growing from a small company to a big company, you have to hire more people, right? You have to build bigger facilities. You have, there's all kinds of benefits, ripple effects of a small company becoming a big corporation. But then you, how many lives do you impact with your product? And this is one where I don't know that there's a limitation on the amount of products that would get better. So how many lives are being positively impacted off of this whole thing, right? Mm -hmm. That's how you make real change in the world in a positive way, right? Mm -hmm. And when I talk to you and I and I think about all of these things that, that you can make better, and that means quality of life better for how many people? I mean, that is something that, Every day, you, you must go to sleep. You must sleep really well, right? 
I have lots of things to think about. So yes and no. <laughs> but I agree. I mean, it's it's immeasurable to to think of the potential impact that that in itself was what drew me to this company. And there's the obvious benefits. You know, you can improve the lives of your team and you're going to make shareholders a lot of money. That's really exciting on its own. But looking past that, I think is what really drives me. This could actually, as cliche as it sounds, have an impact and change the world. And I think it's so rare. It's so incredibly rare to be involved in a company like that, to have the industrial benefit and have the sustainability benefit. So often it's a trade-off. And we're such clear winners on both sides. It's just, we have all the cards to make this an overwhelming success. See, you're not well known now, but <laughs> I can't wait for the day when you are, because I see that day coming, that I have that clear vision in my head, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it would be a shame. It would be a sin if, if that day didn't come, right? We're doing something wrong. If that's the case, there's, you know, when you have a drug in the uh, biotech industry that, you know, can help somebody that has a, a disease to live a few months longer, mm -hmm. uh, that th those drugs get put on the fast track, right, by the FDA. But this company could literally change the world and we're going to put them on the fast track. Mm -hmm. you know what I mean, I, I, I don't know. I don't know why that doesn't exist. It should exist. If there's, should. I think at some point they're going to be like comparing you to Elon Musk. <laughs> <laughs> My girl can dream. <laughs> I'm telling you, man. It, it, it's it's uh, it's an exciting thing. I think right now it's so early that what everyone needs to see is that validation that of of, of product and what it does right mm -hmm. would you agree with that oh absolutely and you know once we have that validation i do believe that our share price will reflect that and we will have greater access to capital hopefully non-dilutive and i think we can really take off with that it only need we only need one deal to make this a massive company i mean the opportunities that we're looking at they're massive and how many opportunities do you currently have in, in the I, I would say, you know, the the full pipeline is larger than this, but I would say near term and very significant, I would say about 25. And I would say five to seven of those are extremely large in scale. And when I say extremely large, that's more than hundreds of tons of graphene required. And as a reminder, we do sell one ton of graphene. It's generally in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. <laughs> <This> can, <laughs> it can ramp up very, very quickly. And so it's been my balancing act for the past few months has been what I hear from the geek team. What I hear from our team is, I mean, quite literally, we there's nothing that we've tried that we've failed in. Every single thing we've tried, we've had fantastic results. It's a double-edged sword because with some of these companies, they've now expanded the scope. And that's great. I think in terms of Hydrograph, the opportunity is larger. It's larger than it's ever been, but we really, really want those purchase orders to come in that are, you know, upscaling to those pilot scale orders. We want to have contracts signed. We want these full negotiations to take place. And I think we're in this, um, anything could come in at any moment. And we have so many that are very, very close. And I think 2025 is going to be a very exciting year. So it's really just bridging that this last kind of home stretch that we're in. Does it put you, does it put you in a, how do I want to say it? An interesting position because you have these big companies that I would imagine, you know, once they get these, if your results are, are better than they anticipated they were going to be, mm -hmm. I would think you become an acquisition target to these people in a very, but this is certainly not when you would want to sell. No, I think I luckily feel that our shareholders would agree with that. I think that there's a lot of support for us to continue to grow. I mean, we have all the cards for this to be absolutely massive. So going through an acquisition at this stage, I don't think would represent our true value, but that has been discussed. Um, and I do think that there's beyond that, there's been a lot of interest in purchasing our units, which we obviously don't engage in. We're not interested in selling or licensing any Hyperion unit.
it, which is so, which is just so smart. I mean, it's just a really smart approach to now, like you said, double edged sword. And, and, you know, look, people have to understand that a company like this goes public for a reason, and that is to raise capital. Mm -hmm. And until they can get to that point where they're self sustainable, right? Now, you've made all the right moves, you're you're validating the product with the the experts it of of graphene where they created graphene you're um uh, are you able to to i mean i know they have white papers and stuff on on, on uh performance metrics are you able to put, put that out to or is that does that become for the particular customer does that become their they want to keep that in house it depends. So on projects that we have managed and we've funded, we can do that and we are doing that. But in projects, especially defense-related contracts, because we have a few of those ongoing, we really can't share anything that we've discovered. So um, it's always a bit of a balancing act and it's something that we'll continue to revisit. But I think um, I would point out one thing that is interesting is there are quite a few regulations going into effect by 2030. And those mandate that we're going to have to recycle more of our plastics. And this is for automotive companies, aerospace, and you name it. And currently, you know, this is really overlooked. And we're doing, I think this is some of the motivation to look at additional testing with us because, you know, we have the obvious mechanical benefits, but really to look at circularity and sustainability it's going to be huge. And these companies just with regulations will be forced to make changes. We're such a great, you know, enabling technology that we can actually do this. We hope it break even, but I think that, you know, as we kind of grow these data sets, it's going to be an obvious choice. And graphene as an additive is really the only additive that can tackle these large scale problems. <laughs> I, that, that's, that's so exciting to me. And, mm -hmm. um, you thinking that 2025, you think that's going to be the the year where, where it really starts to become obvious? We are so, so close. I really wish I could share with you everything <laughs> that I would like to. We're very close, though, um, with a number of different companies. And obviously, there's going to be a gradual scale up in any event, but it's very exciting. And I think a lot of more forward looking companies that we're working with I think they're they're going to be implementing this uh, much in advance of 2030. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, I mean, to me, that makes a, a, a so much sense, right? I mean, um, why would you want to wait until the last minute? I mean, a perfect example of that would be, you know, drones. The dr whole drone space is um, going through a big change. By 2026, Chinese-made drones are, are not going to be uh, able to be used for like bridge, a lot of our infrastructure and, you know, companies aren't waiting until 2026 to stop using Chinese drones. They're, they're, they're now making that move now. Right. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. that's smart. So that's, a, that's probably another industry, by the way, where graphene would be a big, um, could benefit that entire, that entire space. The drone space. I believe we have some related projects. <laughs> I'll bet. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Do a lot there. I mean, late, late waiting, strengthening. Um, we make things lighter, faster, stronger. So it's a perfect fit. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense to me. And I think we're just getting started with the whole robotics uh, industry, right? I mean, that is, that is something that uh, I think you're going to play a huge role in. If you look at all of the industries that, that you could participate in, that's an awful lot of graphene. Do you think you could keep up making it all? You know, <laughs> this, this question keeps me up at night because the amount of interest we have in our ability to scale, I mean, these are great problems that I hope we're about to have very soon, but I don't know. I will try my best <laughs> to scale as quickly and effectively as possible. I mean, you know, I, I think about your your potential path to, to scaling, right? Mm -hmm. And for different in industries and different partners, I mean, it could make sense for you to just 
to, I mean, I understand you want to keep the whole pie, right? But if it makes sense to look, they build the factory, they build every, or they build the, what, what needs to be built, right? They take on all that costs and you, you get a in perpetuity, very nice piece of that pie for the rest of <laughs> That's a that's a really good way to do things without having to go through a burn a lot of cash, right? True. I mean, I think in this stage it makes sense that we can either secure a debt financing or, you know, a number of other more creative means, but as we grow, I think more and more becomes available to us. We just don't want to engage in any of these agreements when right. we're Yeah. I got you. Mm -hmm. All right. So, um Let's talk about, let's just real quickly touch on probably if, because you told me something before we hopped on, which is you have this, you know, potentially massive opportunity. Your stuff performed so well that it unfortunately broadened out the whole scope of everything. So you weren't going to get this, this purchase. You're not going to get the purchase order when you thought you were going to get this purchase order because they want to expand it. Well, that's a fantastic thing to have happen. But for a company that is looking for that first really big order, right, that's tough because yeah. cash is needed, right? Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> if one of these big purchase orders doesn't come in soon, the mm -hmm. odds are you're probably going to have to raise cash. But I would probably assume, I would assume that if that is the case, mm -hmm you're going to raise as little as you need. I mean, as little as possible to get you through what you need to get through. Right. Would you agree with that? I would. I would. Okay. And th that's the reality of it. Right. Hopefully if that, after that raise, hopefully the big purchase order comes in and you never look back. Right. I really hope. <laughs> but as it stands, I can't control everything. Right. So I think we're very, very lucky to have extremely loyal shareholders. I don't have any concern about our ability to raise in the future. Um, and I think that just as you're saying, we would take the absolute minimum to avoid dilution, especially if we're hanging out at around where we're at currently. Right, right. Okay. Yeah. So look, if, before anybody flips out, you know, <laughs> it says, I mean, look, this is reality. Sometimes you have to make choices in the short term that aren't, aren't always, uh, ideal but there are a lot of things that you do not have control over so you know you have a situation though that it was it's very unique that <laughs> you're getting stuff pushed back because your stuff's too damn good right i mean it, it's such a double-edged sword i'm so happy that we're performing so well and that the scope is only getting bigger with every customer really that we're speaking with but we just really want that proof in you know we want it in writing and we want to be able to issue pr so right. it's, right. it's close. It's just so hard to say the exact day when you're dealing with very, very large companies, when they're going to pull the trigger. Listen, I know mm -hmm. yeah, I get companies all the time that, you know, I, retail investors are funny because they want to see news all the time. It's like, why yeah. aren't you <laughs> announcing this? Or why aren't you announcing that? Well, because the customer doesn't want to tip their hand to what, they're doing. They don't want their competition to know what they're doing. And, and on that, it's highly unlikely that customers will accept to be named. So we're probably going to have to say, you know, aerospace company blah blah. Yeah. I don't we're gonna be able to name any of the whales anytime soon. And that's fortunately, we'll push for it, but they're not gonna say yes. Not they get a red line. You you put out what you want to say in a PR, and then you get a red line thing back that says, yes. yeah, you're not going to say this. You're not going to say that. You're not going to say this, right? But that's the way it is. And mm -hmm. you just have to trust that um, there is a reason. And if the customer, you're not, I don't think you would be the kind of person that's going to say, oh, no, let's, let's just go ahead and name them. Because that's how you lose a big, big, big contract, right? Oh, that's no, yeah. you can't burn a bridge. No. Right. It's not worth it. So retail investors just have to suck it up and, and realize that there are going to be a lot of customers that are 
probably not going to want their names divulged. They, but at the point now, that we are signing, I don't think anyone's going to care. <laughs> if money is coming in and we have that definitive proof and we see revenue, this thing is going to take off. Yeah. All right. Here, <laughs> is there anything that you feel as though I, I have missed? If, is there anything that you really want to try to emphasize to, to anybody watching? Um, you know, I think we've done a good job highlighting the opportunities. I think that, you know, that pipeline is growing by the week. But I think one thing I'd like to touch on is perhaps our scale up plans. Okay, Where we have um, quite a few. So we have a very long um, strategic plan internally that I will say right off the bat that if a large customer comes through and wants to sign a contract with us, we probably would give them preference over what might be best for us in this stage. Um, but really, because our operational home base is in the U.S., we are looking at different regions within the U.S. And predominantly when it comes to acetylene production, it is Texas and Louisiana. I think Texas has quite a few clear benefits. Um, you know, it's very business friendly, very low tax state um, for many reasons. And I think that comparing um, just geographical or, or weather related concerns, Texas is a very clear winner. So, well, Elon Musk is there. He is there. <laughs> I'll say hi. <laughs> See, I told you you're gonna they're gonna be comparing it to Elon Musk. Uh, no, I so Texas makes a lot of sense to me. I um in a lot of ways, right? I mean, that makes a lot of sense to me. Big, big, big state, right? And mm -hmm. uh, a lot of industrial stuff goes on in that state. I think I'm pretty sure. It's very hydrocarbon friendly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so that's what you're looking at right now. You, you've kind of narrowed it down to two, two states, right? Full list is a little bit more complicated than that because it, it depends on some other variables, but to keep it simple, I think that if things continue as we expect, it would very likely be Texas. And, um, you know, again, we don't plan to fund that scale up with equity, um, so we'll likely look at debt financing and, you know, be as non-dilutive as possible. And of course, um, Texas has a lot of state incentives that I think are a good match. So we're going through that process with various states. Kirsten, I love talking to you. I can't wait until we can talk <laughs> and you can tell me some of the stuff that you really want to tell me, but you can't tell me. I can't wait until that You're time. You're going to be my first call. I'm going to call you and we're going to plan the next <laughs> time. <laughs> All right. Fantastic. Uh, the next Next catalyst, I guess, is mm -hmm. when we uh, when whenever you think this is important and we need to let people know, mm -hmm. make sure I I'm informed and we'll, and we'll, I'll get you on no matter what I've got planned. I will get you on and and we will make it happen. Okay. Yeah, that sounds great. All right, all right. Uh, I would highly recommend to those watching, listening, go to their investor relation website and sign up for investor email alerts. That way you will be aware of what's happening with the company. It gets sent directly to your email. And this is one I think you absolutely want. Don't let this thing fall off your radar, right? And if you're not in it, listen, I don't tell people how, I don't tell people what to buy or when to buy. All I do is present the story and why I believe it's a good opportunity. And if you think about what we just talked about and you think about where the price of this stock is currently sitting, uh, Kirsten, the, 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 there is one thing I would like to ask. Once you get these, let's say a couple of really substantial orders and you've got revenues, wise, mm -hmm. at some point, do you see that, that you would want to uplist to a senior exchange already going through those conversations absolutely okay. absolutely right okay so that's that's i will say i'm gonna I, i'm gonna emphasize this don't go too early okay don't, i totally agree it has okay. to be the right time it has to be the right time i mean all cylinders firing and no signs of a slowdown right nothing but blue sky that is when because you have two bad quarters once you get uplisted to the senior exchange you, they can punish you i mean they can yeah. literally punish you mm 
-hmm. And then you're spending all your time just trying to stay listed, right? That's, that is a terrible position to be in. Mm -hmm. So you'll know, I, I don't even, <laughs> a very, very, very smart person. <laughs> I don't need to have this conversation with you. Uh, but this is what I was going to say to you that are watching. I'm going to move your logo out of the way for a minute here. So the stock has literally kind of found this little area of support at around, what is it, seven, eight cents, goes up to 11 cents or so, and then it comes, it's just literally going sideways. And that to me is what you call building a base or a launching platform, right? We could launch off of this. So the wider the base, more of a, a launch you have. You have a re reverse head and shoulders pattern, I'm, I'm talking all this stuff that you, you probably have no idea what I'm talking about. But there is a reverse head and shoulders pattern on the long-term frame. Uh, and, and this is an interesting area of, of support. Now, could there be a capital raise? Well, we just talked about that. Yes, that could happen. If it is, If it does happen, it, it, it would be something that would be um, very small or just what is required to get to that next level. And I think you have a, you don't have just one opportunity. You've got, you heard it from uh, Kirsten, there's 25 opportunities that are very real and there are more, but she can't say cause she'd have to kill me. So that, <laughs> this is, if you look at where the price of this stock is, you can literally go, pull some, some change out of your sofa and buy some shares, right? I mean, go scrape the, the quarters and dimes out of your car. Uh, there's, and you can buy some shares and be part of this thing. That's the beautiful thing about this, the stock market is you can own, part, be a part owner of a company that's going to change the world. And I mean, that may sound hokey, but I believe it to be true. So, for, for, for nickels and dimes, you can li literally be part owner of this company. And that is something that I would say you can take pride in, right? Um, so that's that's my, my recommendation is take a hard look at this. Don't go all in. You don't have to buy a million shares all at one time. You can do, build it over time. Just keep adding to that position, right? And as the story grows and gets better... You'll, you will see that a little bit of money can do a lot of good uh, for a lot of people if they just know about the opportunity. And, and that's what this channel is all about. This is a big one. This is a big, I'm telling you, this is like if you're a fisherman, <laughs> you were out. This is like, man, I caught a big one. And this this will be fun. So that's it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hop off. Hydrograph, go to their website, sign up for their IR. And Kirsten, I can't wait to talk to you again. Likewise. <laughs> All right, I'm going to shut this off. Hold on one second. Thank you for tuning in to another CEO interview here at Alpha Wolf Capital. Today we had Kirsten Brewer from Hydrograph. I hope you enjoyed today's interview. And if you did, do us a favor, give us a like. How about giving us a share? while you're at it make sure you smash that subscribe button all of those things are extremely important to us here at alpha Wolf capital and we appreciate you taking the time to do that until next time stay safe alpha wolf capital wishes you the very best of success